Hey everyone, I'm Alan, which means this is the Theater Podcast. This is an all-new episode with Conrad Rickamora. You can see tearing up the dance floor, uh, you know, the Broadway theater in Here Lies Love eight times a week. He grew up an army brat, moved around, had no exposure to the arts or to performing, and then like found his home in in, in performing arts and theater later on in life. And uh, he tells the story really well, so I'm going to let him tell it and get straight into this. Of course, find me online now on Threads, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all the places. Leave a rating, leave a review, and everybody please enjoy this episode with Conrad Ricamora. Here you go, one, two, three... Our guest for this episode may be best known for his six seasons as the role of in the role of Oliver opposite Viola Davis on the ABC network hit How to Get Away with Murder or How to Travel All the Way to Mordor, as I say in this nerdy house. He has TV and film credits, including Fire Island, Over the Moon, Talladega Nights and The Lights, uh, The Light of the Moon. Broadway, Off-Broadway and regional credits include The King and I, which was his Broadway debut, Little Shop, Soft Power and countless plays penned by none other than Will Shakespeare. He is a 2016 Human Rights Campaign Visibility Award recipient and 2017 Equality California Award recipient and can now be seen and the Broadway hit Here Lies Love, reprising his role of Aquino, which he developed 11 years ago in the original Off-Broadway uh, workshop. I, I, we'll get into that. Conrad Ricamora, holy crap, man. Welcome to the Theater Podcast. All right, thanks. It's good to be here. So I want to I want to just kick into this real quick and and talk about the awards, because these awards are very cool. So the Human Rights Campaign Visibility Award, what is that? Oh, uh, it's from this, uh, the nonprofit organization, the Human Rights Campaign, which fights for uh, rights for people in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and uh, which surprisingly, or I guess maybe not surprisingly, have lately been under assault. <laughs> not surprising. In our very own country. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, for playing mainly for playing Oliver, who is an out HIV positive character on TV. Did you get any sort of, I mean, this was what, 26 seasons. So it was 20, what was how to get away with murder? It was 2014 to 2020. 20, yeah. 2014 to 2020. We so, wrapped like two weeks before everything shut down. Wow. Well, that yeah. was good timing. Yeah. Um, and, and I watched pretty much every episode with my wife. Um, in 2014, I mean, unfortunately, still at that point, I think being a, an openly gay character living with HIV on TV in 2014 was still kind of a big deal, right? So was that, did you get like any sort of weird feedback or unexpected um, criticism or anything from that sort of thing? Uh, no, I felt like it was really welcomed. Uh, that was the response that I, 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 I'm sure there was stuff that I didn't read or <laughs> didn't see that, uh, uh, that, that was pushed back on it. But, um, um, oh yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel like in general the there was, there was pushback because we showed some pretty, uh, I was involved with some, uh, sex scenes on, network primetime network tv that uh was really pushing the boundary at the time and i i think that there were some comments uh about like oh this is why do we why do we have to see this and it's like well it's just about equality it's just about showing you know if if there are heterosexual like sex scenes on tv why mm -hmm. can't the equivalent be shown uh in the same setting why is it why is there a disparity um so that it, it's kind of I, I was really proud of it because it normalized uh a lot of um for a lot of people not just that not just gay characters but that you know gay characters have sex lives gay people have sex lives <laughs> and i feel like the tv the show like normalized that and made it uh made people feel m more okay with their own sexuality absolutely uh, yeah I, and i mean i like that we're that it is becoming normalized and i i enjoy when when um people of any sexual orientation just have a relationship and it's not a plot point 
You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it's not they're the sidekick because they're gay. It's just like the, this is somebody that just happens to be a human and have Re- preferences. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right? So I get it. And and was that um did that lead into the uh the other award as well, the the Equality California Award? Yeah, I mean I think that because uh murder was such a big hit that uh it was and it was you know, all of these awards for visibility. I was very visible <laughs> in every aspect of in every sense of the word. Um, so the awards uh, recognized that, um, which, you know, I was happy about because I didn't have that kind of visibility as a little gay boy growing up in the South. Uh, it, I was m- much needed in uh, when I was growing up in the 90s and just wasn't anywhere to be found um so yeah it was it was i was happy to be providing that acceptance and visibility to people now so here lies love is is such an interesting show and 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 the fact that it was a i mean there's many things in 2004 the concept album came out um with david byrne and fatboy slim co-created it and it went it had two different runs off broadway and then it had a seattle out of town uh oh wait, no 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 2013 2014 off broadway 2014 in london 2017 in seattle and then now on broadway yeah yeah we had two we had a run the first run in public at the public was 2013 and then uh, the the London run, I think, was after that. And then we went back to the public in 2014 because they couldn't find a space that would allow us to tear up the seats of a theater. Um, and then uh, 2017 at in Seattle. Um, but yeah, it was it, it had a hard hard time finding a home because it's so. I mean, you have to literally renovate a theater. <laughs> Right. So that was going to be one of my questions was if you knew whether or not the original concept was was to turn a a, a massive stage into a nightclub. No, I never I don't I I never asked David uh, or Alex if that was the goal. I think that and I'm guessing that it wasn't ever the goal because David just kind of creates without uh, and I I feel like he creates without a specific end goal he it's my sense of 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 the way his mind works and the way his creativity works is that he just follows his instincts and his impulses it's not like he's like you know how he he doesn't have a very commercial brain (laughs) it's not like he's like we're gonna sell out this broadway theater (laughs) you know uh it's it's very much just like this seems like uh a story that needs to be told. This seems like a concept. Oh, this person in history is really interesting. Oh my gosh, they went to studio 54. Uh, why why these things need to exist together? Like this, this is a, a a crazy, like coincidence. Um, so, uh, I don't think that he ever had like the end goal of a theater in mind. (laughs) Well, so I guess, how did you get involved back in the original workshops to to originate this character right because that was like i said 11 years ago oh yeah no i i was in my third year of my mfa program at the university of tennessee and i was reading uh the new york times and i saw that they were doing developing this show about amelda marcos and the people power revolution in the philippines and uh i and that it was for people who had like pop rock voices and that's kind of i'm i'm not like a classically trained uh singer like i mostly gravitate towards pop rock r&b type uh music and my voice kind of sits in that realm mostly as well so i was like oh my gosh this this and my dad's from the philippines so uh i was like that i feel like i should be a part of this and so i asked if i could fly up and go to an open call um uh, and my professor said yes. I uh, flew up and got into New York City at around 1 a.m. Waited in line at 7 a.m. to uh, for the open call, and got passed through. Uh, 
got asked to come back the next day, called my professor and was like, so they asked me to stay another day. Can I stay another day? And he said, yeah. Um, and uh, then I was in the room with Alex Timbers and David Byrne and the rest of the creative team. And, um, and then they asked me to come back the next day and I was at school, uh, my university of Tennessee is connected to an equity theater called the Clarence Brown theater. And, mm -hmm. uh, I was doing kiss me Kate and we had a show. So, and we didn't have understudies, so I had to go back. Uh, but they were like, okay, that's fine. And then the next day while I was in class in my acting class, my phone rang and it was a New York number and I answered it and they said, I got the part. <laughs> wow. So did you get to finish? the semester then or oh yeah yeah, yeah? because uh, it just all timed out like i graduated and then the workshop started two weeks later after sh our showcase in new york wow well that's yeah that's very fortunate yeah <laughs> you know, I, let's let's say they did it all for you well we'll go with yeah. That. yeah yeah we'll go with that um and i want to back up again we're going to talk about here lies love so much because this is it, it intrigues me in so many ways but uh born in Santa Maria, California. And so that's one side of the country. And then you grew up in Niceville, Florida. Niceville. Yeah. You, yeah. Got, you got pleasant, you got plant, you got all sorts of fun things. Florida has- You are the first things. person to make that joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, ple is it, isn't there, 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 oh, there's sunshine. There's all sorts of weird things down there. I think there. there's a Pleasantville, New York. I isn't think. It? Yeah, something I, like that. that. Some, there's one nearby. I don't, so, I don't know. But I know, and we're, we'll talk about your 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 dad's connection to the Philippines and and actually the the true history when we get back to um, here lies love. But I want to like what brought you to California? What brought your family to California? And then how the move? How'd you get the move over to Florida? Yeah, no, my dad came over from the Philippines when he was a ten or eleven, uh, and then they started out in British Columbia and Canada, and then eventually settled down in Long Beach. Uh, and then he went into the military when he was 18. And then we just, after that, uh, trotted all over to military bases. We lived in Iceland for a little while. We lived no in, kidding. Yeah, because uh, there's an Air Force base in Reykjavik. Right. Uh, and then we lived in Denver. Um, and then Florida, was, middle school through high school was in Florida. Interesting. So, uh, were 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 you have um, did you have a, do you have a favorite place that that you look back on in your childhood? Because like con continuing to live in Reykjavik would have made you a much different person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I I, I still want to go back because I was I was pretty young, but I do have memories of it. Uh, but I really like Denver. We were there for like two years, um, and I remember really liking it there. Yeah. Oh, the mountains. I mean, you can't beat that. I, I yeah. love the West Coast for the same reason. Like you just have yeah. beach and mountains right there. And then mm -hmm. Denver is just like this clear air. And then Florida, Florida, screw Florida for many yeah. reasons. I, know. I mean, yeah, it's that's Florida's going through a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Florida's going through a buttload of things. All right. We're going to take a quick break for an ad or two. Stay tuned. And now we're back. Do you have a touch point in your life? Do you remember that moment where, I mean, you're, you're traveling all the time. So what was that moment where you're like, oh, this is what I want to do to, to start performing, to get into film, to theater? And no, I, yeah, I had no exposure to the arts at all because I was growing up on military bases and it was very much a machismo culture. Um, uh men and boys expressing themselves in any way was not uh just not allowed uh and so, so uh even though i was traveling around and living in different areas i was pretty much you know our home base was the air force bases and uh it wasn't until i went away to college that i went to the theater for the first time um, and took an acting class there in my junior year of, of undergrad. And uh, that's when it really it kind of exploded for me. Um, I mean, I really, oh, when I was a little, little kid, I liked to sing and dance, like just in, in my bedroom and like making up little routines. Um, but then I remember a certain point around fifth, sixth grade, when it was like, oh, this is very clear that this is no longer allowed, that I have to like, <laughs> oh. going to get beat up every single day. 
Um, and that was just the reality of, you know, there, there was, there was no outlet for it. So I couldn't, there, there was nowhere for me to put it. That's interesting. I sort of had the reverse, uh, cause I, I, as a little kid, I was in chorus and like boys chorus and some theater stuff in, uh, Clearwater, Florida. Like I was in Gainesville uh-huh. and in Clearwater, Florida. And then I moved to North Carolina and I know you, you were in Charlotte at one point. I moved yeah. to, to Wilkesboro, North Carolina when I was about 10, 10, I think 10 or 11. I can't remember now. And in North Carolina, that's where I wasn't allowed to express myself anymore. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, Southern Florida is very different than North. I mean, I grew up, the part of Florida I grew up in was right below Alabama. You drive 30 minutes Ooh, north. The panhandle. And, oh, yeah. 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 You're, and uh, you're in Alabama in 30 minutes. So that area is very, very different than like Clearwater, St. Pete, Tampa, Miami, Gainesville, mm. like jacksonville like orlando like all of those areas are very different (laughs) absolutely yeah i i feel that um so then what was your original major then if you didn't get into theater until junior year i was a psych major uh and i played tennis really competitively uh went to school to undergrad on a tennis scholarship and i really liked psychology i like the idea of of the psychology of performance on a tennis court to me was so fascinating and what makes people get into this zone sometimes where all, you know, they block out all the noise um, and uh, what gets in the way sometimes and these expectations of winning and losing and, and um, uh, yeah, I I found, I ended up focusing mainly on sports psychology uh, and that was what I studied in undergrad. So interesting sports psychology. And yeah, so- it, it translates into, I mean, it's, it's, it works, it not works, but it translates and is applicable to theater and to performing arts. It's the idea of if you're, if you're focused on how you're being perceived or if you're focused on uh, anything other than what you are doing, uh, then that's going to you're going to be distracted or be like uh, taken out of what you're doing. I, this that whole the concepts are applicable and transferable. That's literally what I was about to say, and and I equate Broadway to being the Olympian of the the Olympics of theater. Oh so, yeah. So you're an you have to be an athlete in mind and body and be so focused and so present to do your best. <laughs> And, and to, to maintain the physical and the emotional rigor that it is required for eight shows a week is insane. Yeah. So, yeah. So you could be the best singer in the world, but you can't do eight shows a week and like you, you go horse every other day. Right? <laughs> no, so like, one of the things David told me when we were developing Here Lies Love 11 years ago, and he was like, oh yeah, like he wrote a, an initial song and I was like, uh, David you don't, you realize I do have to do this eight times a week. And he was like, Oh, I didn't think about that. (laughs) Cause he like, even pop stars, like they do a concert, but then they have like the next night off or the next two or three nights off. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I I completely get that. And that's, that's why when you see someone just like yourself uh, in the whole cast. I mean, really, gosh, I, when I was, today's Friday as we're recording this, I saw this uh, Wednesday night, two days ago. Oh. And, and the cast, like just everyone's singing their ass off. And <laughs> in a way that, that, I mean, when you objectively, you're like, oh, this is a good show. This is a really good show. And everyone's a great singer. But when you look at it and take a step back and you're like, you have to do this and, and touch these places in your soul and in your psyche eight times a week and make it, because there's somebody who has, a, not only not seen the show before in every single show, but there's also somebody who's never seen a Broadway show before. And so you're giving them that possible moment to change the course of their life because they're, they can get inspired by this. Well, I never thought about it that way. Well, there you go. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I, I love, I mean, I just feel lucky that I get to do this for a living, honestly. Um, yeah, it's hard, but. I mean, it's, it's, I just eternally grateful that I get to wake up and, and, and my day 
gets anchored around doing this, and I love that so much. So this this show, um, Here Lies Love, is is it, it's retelling of the true story uh, of the People's Power Movement and like the rise of the dictatorship in the seventies and the eighties in the Philippines, <laughs> and um, it, it's gosh, I I love the way that it's presented in so much as that uh, it's like, hey, this happened. Here in America, everything was just fine, and we didn't, you know, fine, I put in air quotes, and we didn't really pay attention to it, and then now, it's all happening again in multiple different ways. Like, if we don't do something about it, life's going to get really bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's hard to to know where to even begin with that there's well, it begin just, with your dad yeah. begin with your dad because that's the connection i think you you have to this yeah uh oh gosh um you know it's funny my dad uh doesn't talk he's he's opened up since actually since i booked here lies love 11 years ago he slowly started to to talk more about his time in the philippines and 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 about his life in general um, but he's a pretty like quiet, reserved guy, uh, especially around like you know me and my brother. He opens up more to my stepmom, but like to my brother and I, he's kind of just like stoic. <laughs> well, it's it's um, hard, I suspect, because if you yeah, live through an exile and or an exodus and an immigration like that, where your literal life was at stake, which we take for granted. In a, in a country like America all the time. Um, yeah. Well, and there's somebody at the stage door last night was just like, uh, and wasn't Filipino, but, and they were like, I had no idea about this history. And I was like, me neither. My, like my dad came over here and very much wanted to assimilate and, and, uh, wanted to, um, become as American as possible in order to survive and succeed. And so I think that's why he didn't teach my brother and I Tagalog or Visayan, the two, two dialects that he spoke in the Philippines, um, that he didn't teach us a word wow. uh, when we were growing up. Um, because I think that he came over and saw, you know, how hard it is uh, to, to make it here as someone who has an accent, someone who's from a different culture. Um, and I mean, even today, it's the way that we treat, especially a uh, brown skin folks that come over uh, to the con to this country who uh, who have darker skin or and speak with an accent or speak a, a different language. It, America has not been super kind. <laughs> and still to this oh. day is, you know, <laughs> yeah. We, yeah, we, we yeah. think it was okay, and it was just swept under the rug. It wasn't clean. It wasn't improved. No. Yeah. Well, and and uh, you know, the Philippines was an American colony uh, for for many years, and um, yeah. So it's 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 very much our our histories uh, the, with the Philippines and and america are very much intertwined and interconnected and tangled up in a lot of knots in ways that this show is helping i think all of us uh in the cast uh untangle and make sense of our own identities for the first time right that's, um, that's what i was going to ask about is it's an all filipino cast which i think this is the first time that's ever happened on broadway right yeah yeah so so setting history there and um, a lot of the cast is young on the younger side, and you know, like the, <laughs> on the early, early to mid, late twenties. Twenties is younger. Oh yeah, right? no, you know, uh, I remember you said that the show happened eleven years ago. Christina, who plays my wife uh, in the show and uh, other ensemble ro roles in the show, <laughs> like the first week of rehearsal, she was like, "Oh yeah, when you guys did this at the public, I was 11. <laughs> <laughs> And I just was like, get out. I know. Get out of here immediately. I know. I know. I, gosh, I was talking with, it was like Victoria Clark or somebody the other day who's like, I'm I'm literally in, in like, I inspired people who were 10 at the stage door, you know. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh. I, yeah, now I, she's performing she in, with them. Yeah, well, I mean, she, I, Kimberly Akimbo was the first time I had seen her on stage. And Phenomenal. I it was 
life-changing for me. Such a great show. And she's such a great actress. And Bonnie Milligan for president. I mean, come on. Yeah, that, yeah. that woman. All right. We're going to take a quick break for an ad or two. Stay tuned. And now we're back. So, but, but what I was getting at was now um, you've got uh, your castmates who are pro- probably two, if not three generations removed from some uh, from from this actual uh historical event and the events of of that time period who didn't like you said maybe didn't even know about it or who has who have parents or heritage that didn't talk about it yeah because it was so hard and and it's i'm and i'm seeing a lot of this trend right and and like even um like my uh ramin karen was a buddy of mine and and he won't talk about the, his family's exile from Iran. Like his dad, he's like, that's my dad's story. I know a little bit about it. My dad doesn't talk about it. He doesn't, you know, like there's so much, I guess, sadness and and everything that goes along with it. But for you and your cast, have you been able to like sit down and talk about it and identify with it in any way? Well, I think the way that we identify it is exactly what we were talking about a little earlier is that it's so urgent in our own country right now to learn this history and learn how democracy in another country was, you know, so easily turned upside down and, and, uh, and taken away, uh, I, things that we have taken for granted for so many decades in this country, just having the, the, the right to vote, um, the right to choose our leaders. Um, and then, uh, through our show through here lies love to see how quickly that can be manipulated and taken away, um, is something that I think we all feel is very tenuous right now in our own lives. Uh, so that's the connection that's, you know, our parents can still have their stories, but it's our job right now to learn from different pasts, different histories and different governments. Mm-hmm. And right now we're doing that with uh, Here Lies Love with the Philippines um, to see how fragile uh, uh, our own democracy is. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I get that. Because I was going to say, imagine, you know, in a in an alternate universe, the January sixth insurrection was successful. Yeah, yeah. And so, in in some parallel universe, we now have a dictatorship or a martial law of sorts, where administration didn't accept the outcome, and then they just took over, and that's it. Well, yeah, and and my, I mean, it's still having effects on you know, people who are members of the LGBTQ community uh, with the Supreme Court that was mm-hmm. put into place uh, from the previous administration. It feels like our rights are are still being taken away. Uh, people who are, who benefited from affirmative, affirmative action, which was put into place because people of color were denied and, and uh, s- certain rights and certain um a lot weren't allowed into certain spaces um to see that being walked back now uh is is sobering <laughs> on to a lighter note um the I, I love how uh at the beginning of here lies love um the dj which is the, he's not actually controlling the the music right he'll just or is that, he or is he all right we will <laughs> We'll start that rumor. The DJ is actually DJ. Um, says like karaoke. Philippine Filipino brought the culture brought uh, karaoke over to the states, and and here we are setting the stage, pun intended, for this wonderful, wonderful nightclub that we are now uh, watching the story unfold in. So, the original workshops. I never had the fortune of seeing it off Broadway, mm-hmm. um, either time. But uh, when you figured out or when you were told or shown concept or of what Broadway was going to be, mm-hmm. was that something that you were like, Oh yeah, this is cool. Or like, Holy crap, what are we going to do with this? Because I imagine as a performer, it's so unusual to literally be in the midst of a crowd of people and walking among them and through them and above them and having them look down on you. Like I was, <laughs> I was literally, I was C a one 
on the side of the stage behind what would be the proscenium looking down on people's heads, the performers' yeah. heads. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because I've done it so many times now, I got used to it early on. But I do remember, like, the first, you know, at Williamstown and then the first run at the public just being like, well, I have no idea what this is going to feel like when we get out on stage. I have no idea how people are going to react when we're, you know, brushing up against them as we run through the audience. And, um, but, uh, let's see. (laughs) Um, and luckily it was received, uh, you know, really, uh, really positively. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 in terms of the it ha- happening in a proscenium, um, it I mean it doesn't really happen in a proscenium anymore. We've completely transformed a, a Broadway theater uh, uh, into a nightclub, and I think that's the cool thing is that it, we've we're, we've transported people who are walking into a Broadway theater, and you can feel their people's excitement to to see the space and be in the space for the first time um, that it's just there you're there you're completely transported to a, a studio 54 type yeah. club my jaw my jaw hit the floor like <clears throat> as soon as i went through the doors past the box office yeah i i was just like this is insane and there's yeah. and there's coat check right there just like a regular club right because you're yeah. on the dance floor you don't want big bags or coats hanging around but then you go through and it was so cool for me to walk you're walking through basically through the wings mm-hmm. to get onto the dance floor to go back out into the what traditionally would be backstage and what i when i said about the proscenium earlier is from my seat if i look straight up into, right. the, into the fly I'm looking at the backside of what the of where the the original proscenium was. Yeah, which is kind of yeah. cool because you can see like the bones of the yeah. theater, but then you can see what we've transformed it into. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah. And do you have a contingency plan if if the set pieces don't move? Have you have you gone through Plan B and Plan C for? Oh that yeah, stuff? we just hold. <laughs> but it, <laughs> hold. It's only happened so far. It's only happened once. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. So Greg, our stage manager, gets on the God mic and it's just like, like, like any like show. Yeah. The stage manager just gets on the, the mic and says, actors hold. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's it's so cool, though. And I love I love the, the use of the projections and the lights. And I mean, the whole thing is beautiful. It is such a beautiful set. And the music, of course, David Byrne and Fatboy Slim, equally great. Yeah. And uh, the story itself. Uh, again amazing but um coming out of uh i guess you're we're still in previews now as as we're recording this so the show is is it still being tweaked or are you mostly set at this point uh, mostly set uh they're small i mean up until a week ago we completely restaged one of my numbers where i start in the mez <laughs> and uh that was wild but um yeah, I, I feel it's starting to feel like, OK, we're, we've found what this version of the show is and it's you can feel it crystallizing now. Uh, and I can and I can see in the creative team when we come to rehearsals every day that it's like I can, you, I can feel their excitement about we've taken this this big leap. I, I would think that like this past Sunday and Monday's shows um you could feel like, okay, something has clicked. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden. And, uh, and now it's just, you know, diction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> diction. Stuff like that. Like, <laughs> like you can really uh, lean into your roles now because you're not thinking about where to go so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, open it, you know, when you, that's the great, the thing that, I always find it interesting in this part of part of the process, you know, when in previews and as previews start to wind down into, you know, opening and freezing the show as a 
actor, you kind of have to really start taking the reins over from the creative team and being like, no, I have to own this now. I need, like, I, I really have got to, and, and, and in times like pushing back and being like, well, my, I see, I know what you're saying, but from my experience on stage, this is what the experience is. And this is what, this is how, if you change, if sometimes I feel like creative teams can, can start getting a little bit like bored. And so they're looking for something (laughs) (laughs) This change. And you're like, well, if you change this one little moment, you are not thinking about the way I've created this arc, like through all of these separate other beats, it changes the next beat and the next beat and the next beat. And you really, I think have to start sticking up for your character, uh, at a, as previews start winding down and being like, okay, okay, it's time to, time to solidify this and shut it down. <laughs> like you have to lock, you have to lock your own psyche. Yeah. 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 Uh, have you had, um, any, any fun experiences, um, with the audience being so close? Because I imagine that that would be a little nerve wracking for people who, Maybe introverts specifically who are like, oh, don't touch me, don't touch me. But maybe those people oh, aren't buying dance floor tickets anyway. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, now there's there's nowhere uh, there's nowhere to hide from us because we're up in the mez now. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, yeah, I've, I've learned to read people really quick. I mean, this is also where my military background uh my, uh, you know, growing up on Air Force bases and moving around so, so much, you learn to read people really quickly. Uh, and so uh, now in uh, the show, I can see in the audience through with a quick scan who wants it, it, to be approached and who definitely does not want to be approached. <laughs> and I just don't approach those people. I think it's funny, <laughs> it's funny with that. Skill. <laughs> um, where the camera, it's the first time the camera is going through the audience. Like you have a live camera project, you know, taking footage and then there's like, um, pulling up actual people to be the girlfriends and, and whatnot, <laughs> like to be on camera I think, and everyone's like, <gasps> yeah. so awkward. Yeah. Yeah. I, that was one of my favorite moments. Um, but uh, I think it's just, I think it's just brilliant. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it so much. All right. We're going to take a quick break for an ad or two. Stay tuned. And now we're back. Before we get into the three closing questions, I ask everybody to wrap up the episodes. I want to quickly talk about Wilbur and Presley. Oh, Wilbur and Presley. Well, Presley's meowing in the background now. <laughs> so your your cat and your dog, and there's a lot of uh, wait, Wilbur. Wait, Presley's the dog, right? Presley is the cat. A oh, Presley's the cat. The yeah. latest Instagram picture you posted of the two of them <laughs> together just gets me because I love cats who sit like people. <laughs> <laughs> He is the funniest just like it's a self-made ch- like he creates his own chair and yeah. just sits on himself <laughs> big cat butt i love that i love that yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right so um first closing question for you just what motivates you uh storytelling and connecting through stories if you could uh give advice to your younger self and younger people listening now starting out down a similar path what would you say Oh, down a similar path. I would just say focus on the work. I feel like there's so much noise in life that if you uh, like what you do, uh, then focus on what that is. And uh, in terms of, I guess, in in acting, in, in, in the entertainment industry, finding out what the actual work is and then letting go of all of the rest of it and uh and also not partaking in too much of because there's so much just hype around what we do and uh in enthusiasm which is great but it's also like okay what is the work <laughs> what is that we're doing <laughs> and remind david byrne that you have to perform eight times a week and that yeah that yes. all right last last question then if you could only see one show for the rest of your life but you can see it as many times as you want what would you see Ooh, one show for the rest of my life but i could see it as many times as i want oh boy um 
You know, I recently uh, went and saw with my husband, we went and saw Hades Town, and I just, I mean, I, I love that. Sh I saw it at New York Theater Workshop and then brought the Broadway run, and then um, Eva Noblezada is still in it, and mm -hmm. I, she is un. Real. I mean, I love the show in general, but she is really. I hear the, I hear the cat. Presley's back there. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, but uh, Eva Noblezada in Hades Town, I could watch over and over and over again. I just think that she is like unreal. <laughs> I agree with you. And uh, speaking of of songs that need to be reminded that they need to be performed eight times a week, uh, uh, Anais Mitchell wrote. Um, the uh the or orpheus right Reef oh, yeah. he wrote over his role in her own range like a female range just because <laughs> that's all she knew to do and then yeah. all of a sudden it's like stupid high for men oh yeah and she's like oh, i didn't even think about that but then you can get <laughs> people like reeve who just knock it out yeah. that's great yeah it's great that's it's insane to watch yeah. him do that <laughs> amazing so uh where can we find you online on the on the socials uh, at Conrad Ricamora on Instagram and uh, and now the new threads mm -hmm. I just signed up uh, and yeah it's just at Conrad Ricamora I think on I'm not really on TikTok but I, I think <laughs> it feels strange to be talking about TikTok at 44 years old uh, but <laughs> it's at Conrad Wayne Ricamora but uh, you know that. I probably post a video every six months. <laughs> I found, uh, I actually did this uh, after Here Lies Love. I took a bunch of little videos of, of, of different parts of walking in and then just said uh, auto cut. And, oh, really? And it made the reel I've got up there now. And I, I swapped out the music with the Here Lies Love uh, concept track, um, oh, you know, from 2004. But cool. then, but then, yeah, like the auto cut, I'm like, I'm going to do this more often because I'm auto a 42 cut. year old man who doesn't want to learn TikTok either. Well, now so, I have to revisit. I didn't even know about auto cut. I didn't even learn about <laughs> auto cut. Oh, <laughs> no. <anymore>. Dang. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. I got to go to rehearsal. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, you can get more of me on threads now, too, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Leave a rating review. Tell your friend. Go see Here Lies Love. Thanks to Jukebox the Ghost for the intro and outro music you're hearing now. And, Connor, and thank you most of all. This has been so much fun getting to know you. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> all right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Take a deep breath. Make the world a little colorful.